Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Classical Antiquity Side Quest, a podcast covering topics from classical antiquity. The period of time is known for, as Edgar Allan Poe put it, the glory that was Greece, the grandeur that was Rome. Our next side quest will take us to what I think we all might agree is the start of imperial Rome, that being the reign of Augustus. And instead of going through every detail about Augustus's rise to power, we instead spent a lot of time discussing his historical legacy and the big picture elements of his career. If you want to learn more about the nuts and bolts of how he got to power, what happened in each year, and his rivalry with that Mark Antony fella, check out the History of Rome and the Emperors of Rome podcast. They've already covered that in detail, and I saw no reason to do it again here. So what we do learn about, though, is how Augustus took power, and specifically what made him unique compared to those who came before him and others who were around at the time. So we try to discuss why Augustus was able to do what he did, what made him unique in that respect. We also cover his approach to governing and how he set about establishing his legacy in his terms. Also, we conclusively establish a key fact about Dido of Carthage when we discuss the Aeneid. It's major scholarship, folks, so don't skip that part of the podcast. Our guide for this side quest is Dr. Jennifer Garish, a professor at my alma mater, the College of Charleston. Go Cougs! We remember Dr. Garish from her interview on the Bull City Coordinators podcast, where we talked about ancient Rome and our old pal, Julius Caesar. Dr. Garish is an outstanding scholar and an editor of Caesar's Gallic Wars, and she also wrote Sallust Histories and Triumphal Historiography, Confronting the End of History. You can follow her on Instagram, at Caesar's Cookies. Dr. Garish, how are you? I am good. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you for agreeing to come back. That is the main thing. It's always good to have people on here and to keep this thing going, because we've made promises about this podcast not ending kind of have to live up to that. Uh, Are you ready to talk about Augustus? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. My first take on Augustus, having listened to a lot of podcasts covering his reign, his era, read a little bit about it, not a whole lot, is that when he got started in the beginning, he was kind of a brat. And I'm just curious if that's the right take or the wrong take. He just seemed a little bit like a brat when he started out. Yeah, he certainly... Uh, looked at the established political field and gave it the middle finger. Um, yeah, so he he shows up, he has no background in politics, and he says, what if I just didn't play by any of your rules? So yeah, that is that is pretty bratty, I think. And I guess one thing we should talk about is we, it's easier for me just to call him Augustus, but there were a number of different historical names that he had through different periods. We call him one thing at one point, another thing at something else. I I guess, can we get those out of the way, the naming conventions that people use for him? It's really confusing and annoying, but please, if we can just straighten that one out. Yeah, um, it it is also confusing for professional historians because often he's just called Caesar, which becomes the title of all the emperors. And so there's a lot of like, what Caesar, who's on first? Um, so he's uh, his birth name is Gaius Octavius. When he's adopted by Julius Caesar in his will in 44, he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. And then in 27 BCE, he gets the title Augustus from the Senate. Um, So usually when I'm teaching it, I call him Octavian up until 27 and call him Augustus afterward. But it's totally fine to just call him Augustus. So the the Caesar part, is that the name that he actually preferred to go by, Caesar? Or did he prefer something else? Because I know like Frenkeps was bestowed on him at some point. But what... If we could get inside a long dead person's mind, make some sense of it, what would we call him to make sure that we weren't upsetting him and then getting executed? Yeah, yeah. So Augustus would always be appropriate. Um, That was the name bestowed on him by the Senate. And so it would be appropriate as his title. He did like Caesar as well, because so much of his political legitimacy came from the family connection with his 
adopted father, uh, Julius Caesar. So I think either of those would be pretty safe. I think calling him Octavian would get you a look. Um, probably wouldn't get you executed. He was, um, as as um, I'm sure you know, he was surprisingly moderate once he came to power um, after a very bloody rise to power. Eventually, he got there, but it was there was a little bit of a bloodbath, uh, very similar to. Uh, oh God, why am I? I'm, I'm passing on the name of the movie where the blood comes out of the elevator. Jack Nicholson, Stanley Kubrick. Shining? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very, very much like that uh, as as he got to the point where he got to. But you mentioned that he gave the middle finger to the establishment. Talk a little bit about, about how he ended up in power and what it was about him that allowed him to outmaneuver all of his rivals. Because there was some very Game of Thrones-ish kind of power plays, War of the Roses stuff going on there. But how did he end up on top? Yeah, I, I think the key to his rise is that everybody around him was still living in the past. And he was the only person who recognized how the political scene had changed and how the Roman people had changed and because of that, he had a certain audacity or boldness to sort of, you know, like I said before, look at the rules and say, well, what if not that? And so I'll give just one kind of anecdote to exemplify that. In 43 BCE, so it's the year after Caesar was assassinated, he's 19 years old at the time, there is a battle in which the two consuls are killed. And so Rome now needs to have a special election there are all kinds of rules about who can run for consul. Um, you have to have had um, previous offices. You have to meet a uh, age minimum. You have to have done military service. 19-year-old Octavian has done none of these things. But he approaches the Senate and he says, I would like to run for consul on the strength of my connection with my adoptive father. I think you should put me forward as a candidate. And they're like, oh, Day. like that's so cute no we're not gonna put you on the ballot but that is you just keep dreaming big guy good good on you chief and he says oh okay and he approaches a bunch of caesar's veterans um who uh have been sort of looking for a new leader since caesar died some of them have gone with mark antony but most of them are sort of directionless. And so he bribes, you know, we can say he pays them, but he bribes them, the army and gathers them up and marches toward the city of Rome. And they encamp outside the city and Octavian approaches the Senate again. And he says, right. I don't know if you understood my question the first time. My army and I would like for me to be on the ballot for the consulship. And the Senate is sort of like, okay, we don't want another Sulla. We don't want another Julius Caesar. So I guess we have to give him what he wants. And so what he's recognized is that everybody else is using the old playbook, but he's not going to follow it. And through that, all of a sudden, all of these things are open to him, extortion and violence and threats that the sort of, you know, gentlemanly statesmen of the previous generations were a little bit more squeamish about. Um, so I think that that's a pretty good example of this mentality that lets him outmaneuver everybody. He was the OG Septimius Severus, enrich the soldiers, scorn all other men. And boy, is there some scorning. Now, I'm curious, though, it sounds like he was, and you can have good visions and bad visions, right? He was visionary in some sense. Was it was it that he recognized that, hey, it's now about power, right? We've seen this with the evolution of Marius, Sulla, Caesar, the wars, and people just want security. So I just need to accumulate enough power to give them that security. Is that really what it came down to? I think so. I don't know if that was the plan from the beginning. Um, I'm not sure he had a plan from the beginning, except for consolidating power for himself. But I do think as he sort of grows into the role, he recognizes that 
through the concentration of power in the hands of one person, he would be able to create a more stable state than we've seen for the last hundred years with, like you said, guys like Marius and Sulla and so forth. So we can spend a lot of time dissecting each and every move that he and the triumvirate made to come to power, how he consolidated his power, but we all know that he wins. Spoilers, spoilers, in case anybody doesn't know. He wins, he takes control, he turns Rome from this kind of weird, death-dying, sickbed republic to a full-on empire, ruled like an empire. Great coffee mug, by the way. And he, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the uh, Caesar was a total dirtbag mugs are now available to purchase. And Dr. Garish has one. So I actually have one, too, but it's not with me at the moment. So when when Augustus gets his power, he rules for a very long time and leaves behind a legacy and I want to talk about that legacy some. And let's start with whether he was an effective leader. Did he care about government for government's sake? What kind of an administrator was Augustus? Yeah, he was a very capable administrator. And I think it's it's all the more impressive what he was able to accomplish because he created an entirely new office, right? So the, the we call it the Principate, the office of the princeps or the emperor uh, did not exist. Um, and so it's really over the course of his, um, you know, 40 year reign that he sort of ad hoc piecemeal figures out what it means to be the emperor. And I think it takes a very sophisticated mind to sort of, you know, build the plane as you're flying it. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so he's, he's a good political thinker. He, um, in terms of, you know, good government for good government's sake, I, I'm not sure that is, is something that would have resonated with him. Um, it's, uh, almost immediately upon coming to power, uh, you know, it's, it's the thing always with power is like, as soon as you get it, you have to figure out how to hold on to it and how to pass it down. And so almost immediately he's going to shift into this sort of, um, legacy building mode um, in terms of defining the principate and then defining the line of succession. And that's going to be a big preoccupation of his reign. Well, one thing that he did to ensure that he had power was basically put a y'all stay out of Egypt sign up, right? <laughs> uh, he's like, this is mine. Can you talk a little bit about some of the steps that he did to make sure that he would be secure from others? Yeah, um, so so that's one of the big ways that um, he sort of prevents anyone from being able to do what he did is to um, start sort of layering in more and more bureaucracy. One of the ways to do that is to prevent anyone from gaining power in the provinces by really diffusing the authority in the provinces. Um, so in the old Republican system, someone like Julius Caesar would get a provincial governorship in a place like Gaul, where he could get really rich, he could build up the loyalty of his personal army, and then use that to march on Rome. And so what Augustus has to do is make sure no individual can spend too much time in a lucrative province. Um, and those who hold those governorships need to be handpicked by Augustus to make sure that we've got loyal people out in those provinces so that we don't have to worry that the governor of Egypt, the governor of Syria is building a little personal army. Um, so that's one of the ways that um, he sort of insulates himself. He's also going to exert a lot of control over the consulship and the other elected offices. Um, you know, Rome continues to have a Senate going forward. Um, it doesn't just go away now that we have an emperor, but the ballots are going to be heavily curated. Um, you're not going to run for office unless Augustus is happy with you. So it's through those sort of means that he makes sure um, no individual is going to gain too much power, and those who do have um, a little bit of governing authority are all going to be people who are sympathetic to his regime. Now, you, you've talked about how he's 
kind of using the Senate and he's being very careful with his mass machinations and the levers that he's pushing, would he do a lot of this kind of behind closed doors and, and then have announcements get made on his behalf? Or was he more of a, uh, come out, tell everybody, this is what we're going to do in public. Was he a behind the scenes type of a guy or how, how would that work? Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that he was, deeply secretive. Um, a lot of this is going to be done really transparently through legislation as part of this program of sort of um, showing himself as the leader of this new golden age. Um, so as an example, one of the things that he does is pass a suite of legislation over over the course of maybe 10, 15 years, um, the, uh, the Leges Julii or the Julian Laws, and some of them are like weird stuff about adultery and childbirth, um, but some of them are also explicitly trying to regulate the election process. Um, so putting new penalties on election bribery as a way of, you know, being really sort of public facing in his, you know, anti-corruption uh, standpoint. So he's, yeah, I think he is uh, relatively transparent. I mean, I'm sure there is like, palace intrigue. Um, if you believe I, Claudius, there's lots of palace intrigue. Um, but but a lot of it was was quite straightforward because it's part of this image he's cultivating of himself as, um, you know, a strong leader for the golden age. Well, and he'd also had Julius Caesar deified. He mm -hmm. gets deified later. Son of a god. Very savvy. But he also... I, from what I remember, he would kind of say, well, I don't really want to be in charge for another 10 years. And then the Senate would be like, oh, no, please, we really need you. And he's like, well, I guess. Sure. Why not? Is that how he would play this out? These kind of noble protestations that had all been worked out in advance? Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of like false humility. Um, uh, you said the word um, princeps earlier. So this just translates to like first guy. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have a regal overtone. It's just sort of like, hey, I'm the one who happened to end up here. Um, he also likes to be called primus inter pares, which means first among equals. So there is this sort of pretense that like, hey, you know, I'm just, I'm just serving my country. Um, and where this all really gets consolidated in the last year of his life, he writes a document um, called the Res Gestae Dewi Augusti, which just means the accomplishments of the divine Augustus. Um, it's an inscription, so it's carved into bronze, um, what do you say, pillars that are set up in Rome. And it's his autobiographical account of like the stuff he did. And one of the things he says over and over again is he tells you what things he turned down. So he'll say, the Senate offered me five laurel wreaths and I turned them down. The Senate tried to make me, you know, grand poobah, contrary to the customs of our ancestors, and I turned them down. So yeah, he really wants you to know um, uh, how moderate he is in his power. Um, it's, a, it's a very very weird document, um, but it's uh, responsible, I think, for how positively history remembers him. Nothing says humility like giant bronze tablet, <laughs> exactly. highlighting how great you are. Yep. It could have been gold, right? I mean, that really would have been too much. It shows a lot of restraint to only use bronze. Yeah. Well, one of the things, too, you, that I, I'd like to talk to you about is you've mentioned the concept of a golden age several times, because nothing says traditions of our ancestors like going back to a kingdom style of government. But there were a lot of building projects that he embarked on, including with his first lieutenant, uh, Marcus Agrippa, who is a big deal that we should talk about. But can you talk about that element of his legacy, what he did to rebuild and revitalize Rome after what, with all the killings and murders and civil wars and what have you? Yeah, yeah. He liked to say that he inherited a city of bricks and left a city of marble. Um, yeah, a lot of his building projects are still visible in the city of Rome today. Um, this kind of centerpiece of his building program was the Forum of Augustus. Um, the Forum, it's like 
it's kind of like a downtown. You've got um, religious buildings and political buildings and commercial buildings. It's just like the town square. It's the place where you would go. And, and he builds a new forum that is decorated with um, imagery meant to kind of show him as the culmination of Roman history. So there's a statue of Aeneas and there's statues of Romulus and Julius Caesar and other, you know, uh, Scipio, famous heroes of the Roman past. And then at the top of the forum is a temple to Mars the Avenger. And it's got statues of Mars, Venus and Julius Caesar. So he, you know, puts this really um, grand structure that emphasizes his connection to divinity. Um, so that's one place where he's sort of using the physical city to create a legacy. He also builds something called the Arapacus or the Altar of Peace, um, which is a really popular monument today. Um, you can you can go visit it. It was, <laughs> unfortunately, it was restored by Mussolini, which isn't great, um, but we do say thanks Mussolini for fixing our stuff. Um, but it's, uh, uh, it's called the Altar of Peace. Boy, and the irony there is just <laughs> yeah. through the roof. But it is, but it's, by the time he builds it, I think it's commissioned in 13 and it's finished in nine. Nobody's thinking about the civil wars anymore. And it's got all these pictures. Um, so the frieze on the top is the Augustan family. There's Augustus and Livia and uh, his grandkids and cousins. And it's this display of continuity like don't worry everybody i brought you peace and look at my beautiful family we are going to ensure peace for generation after generation and this is something you would see walking through the city um and and it's through this kind of repetitive imagery that he uses the physical landscape to again like cultivate this you know i'm the leader of your golden age and if you've got Aeneas on there, I was while you were uh, explaining that, I pulled up my copy of the Aeneid, which has a family tree. And uh, Aeneas there is the son of Venus and uh, some other gods further back, it looks like. So, mm -hmm. you know, nothing like that to remind the people how important you are. Again, very modest, very, very modest. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, we, one one thing that I do want to talk about, and I feel like we're we're giving Agrippa a little bit of short shrift, and we do need to come back to him at some point. But Augustus reigns for a very long time, and that I think is probably more than anything else what allowed the imperial concept to take hold because he stayed alive so long there was no chance to go back to anything else. But one thing that I've heard some discussion about on some other podcasts relates to. Could we call Augustus a tyrant? Is he tyrannical? I'm just curious if you have a take on that, and if so, what it is. Because I feel like we're we're taking... Well, I mean, that term was used back then, but it, it's hard for me to class him necessarily as a tyrant because he seemed more like the evolution of Roman... Uh, he, he, was, he was kind of the final arc in that, his, that stage of Roman development, which you can develop in good ways or bad ways. But I'm just curious what your take on that is. Yeah, it's it it's not the word I would use. Um, so in the original Greek context, a tyrant was just the name for a person who took power in a coup. Um, so it was like someone who came to power through force rather than through election or through a hereditary dynasty. And so in that like very, very technical sense, he was a tyrant. But in terms of like the modern sense of, of how we use it to describe a despotic ruler, um, I, I don't I don't think I would use it uh, for Augustus. Um, he was certainly an autocrat. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. You know, yeah, we still have a Senate, but this is it's they're not even rubber stampers like they they are just window dressing. Um, they're purely cosmetic at this point. Um, but once he comes to power, he doesn't purge his enemies. 
Um, he doesn't use the military against Roman citizens. And like, these are the things I think of when we're talking, of, you know, about like a tyrant in the modern sense. Um, that's all after he becomes Augustus. In his early career, he had no problem wiping out uh, political enemies. But, but once he becomes an autocrat, he does seem to exercise that power in um, a largely nonviolent way. I mean, even people who, uh, you know, publish pamphlets satirizing him, you know, um, uh, he uh, hears about people making fun of him and like street theater and things like that. Um, and the biographers tell us he didn't like it, um, but he doesn't punish these people. So, so tyrant isn't the word um, that that I would pick for him, but I, I can kind of understand um, why why someone might describe him that way. Yeah, and he had that. Well, he was kind of harsh on a couple of his family members. Uh, oh it yeah, seemed. That <laughs> and he, he was weirdly obsessed with morality. And uh, anyway, we could talk about that scene in I Claudius where the guy playing him, whose name I'm. I'm spacing on the great Brian blessed. <laughs> that's right. That's right. From flash Gordon is going through. And I think he was actually in the Phantom Menace too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was boss Nass. Boss. Yeah. My, uh, terrible movie. Anyway. So he's, I go on, I, I, let me tell you the side quest I could go on with that. I'm not going to because eventually we got rogue one. Perfect movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, there's that scene where who is it his daughter had been kind of out on the town a fair amount repeatedly and he's just asking all the senators have you slept with my daughter have you slept is there with my anyone daughter? here who has not slept with <laughs> my daughter <laughs> yeah uh, so he he was crazily obsessed with with morality which is always kind of icky like to that level uh, but, but that's not the probably best way to describe how just uncomfortable and concerning it is when the ruler of your kingdom is that involved in your personal life or whatever. But anyway, so uh, now, now I'm really distracted. So the, the tyrant thing, I kind of agree with you. It, it, it's, it's difficult to label him as that, but he did set the stage for later tyrants to come into place. And I think maybe that's where a lot of people look back at Augustus and say, this is where it began. But again, I, I think, this is just kind of where Rome was headed. It just happened that he was in power for so long. Now, part of the reason he was in power at all was because of he had one of probably the most underrated generals in Roman history and Marcus Agrippa working with him. And they became friends at a very young age, whereas when then Octavian Augustus was learning how to Pull levers of power working alongside Caesar, he had his friend Agrippa with him. Can you tell us, A, who Marcus Agrippa is and what made him so essential to Augustus's rise to power? Yeah, yeah. So Agrippa, like you said, he was a, a childhood friend of Octavian. Um, so someone who uh, he was close to before he's adopted by Julius Caesar, um, which I think is kind of the the foundation of their trust, because from that point forward, Octavian couldn't know who to trust. When you get that kind of power that quickly, everybody's looking to get something out of you or to manipulate you. And so he was really lucky that he had this person um, who um, who he could you know, trust as a friend and a, a personal advisor. But as one of the greatest military minds probably in, I don't know, I'm gonna say global history um, because I don't know much about other parts of history. I feel confident making that pronouncement. Um, but yeah, so so he was um, just a great tactical mind, um, both for land warfare and sea warfare, which becomes really critical because uh, actually the first uh, major phase of the kind of triumviral wars where he's coming to power, um, is naval warfare against Sextus Pompey. Um, and because Agrippa was so skilled in that, Octavian's able to kind of get Sextus Pompey out of the picture so he can focus on Mark Antony. Um, and, and it's actually a naval battle where 
Agrippa and Octavian defeat Mark Antony as well. Um, yeah, and and so he is the military architect of Octavian's rise to power. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't live um, super, super long after Augustus becomes emperor. I think he dies in like, oh, like 20 or 12 BC, um, fairly, fairly early um, after being um, married to Augustus's daughter and being adopted as Augustus's heir. Um, but unfortunately he does not live to, to be emperor and we get stuck with Tiberius instead. One thing about how important he was that I remember listening to, I think it was in the history of Rome podcast was there was this con there's this idea floated that if after the battle of Teutoburg forest, Agrippa had still been around that Agrippa could have gone out there and done some damage. And now I'm thinking about, again, uh, our, our good friend, Brian blessed, just going around yelling, give me back my legions, give me back my legions. And th that was one of just many reasons why that TV show is so great. But this is one thing that Victor, who had appeared on the podcast to discuss Alexander the great wanted me to ask you, at least in the context of Roman history, as he put it, uh, he, he described it as a Kirk Spock style partnership. And how common or uncommon was that? Because I, I don't feel like it was as effective. But just trying to think of people off the top of my head where you had a pairing of two people that was that effective and that significant in Roman history. Yeah, so I, I think the only reason that it works is that it was a lifelong relationship um, where neither party had to fear that they were being exploited uh, by the other one. I, I can't think just off the dome of any other example of, you know, buddy comedy, <laughs> like pairings, um, but because there's, I think, when you're operating at that level of power, there's so much paranoia. Um, and, and often like rightfully so. I mean, a lot of these guys do get assassinated by their own bodyguard or their own family members. Um, so, so I can't think of any comparable examples off the top of my head. Um, but, but I, I do think that is why that particular partnership works is that it predated the power um, I will admit, I don't know enough about Kirk and Spock to know if that uh, makes it more or less <laughs> parallel. Okay. Star well, Wars, right? Star Wars. Track. <laughs> so, so here's what you need to do. All right. If you really want to watch TV, that's hard to watch. And that oh. does not translate well. Now watch the original series. Then ask yourself, why did I watch it? If you want to watch a really terrible movie, watch Star Trek The Motion Picture. It is awful. <laughs> I mean, it is so bad. Just terrible. I, like, even the plot in it is dumb. But Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Ricardo Montalbaum playing Khan again, not talking about fine Corinthian leather. Amazing. Just fantastic movie. And if you see that, then when you watch the reboot of Star Trek, where they where J.J. Abrams starts to get really lazy as a film writer and they do kind of the con storyline in the second movie. And it's just awful because it's just kind of an inverted storyline and it's not really creative at all. You'll realize again how amazing, just amazing Star Trek to wrap comments. See, so, this, is what, this is why I come on this program is for, for hot tips like that. <laughs> exactly. You can skip everything else and just watch watch the one episode from the original series with, with, with Khan in it. Then skip ahead to Star Trek 2, and then you'll completely get the Agrippa, Augustus, Kirk, Spock, how it fits together. Okay? Now, granted, in Star Trek, there's a lot more about like democracy and building coalition and not ruling from the top down. So it's very much the antithesis of, yeah, of I guess what I'm interested. Right. Right. None of that. Now, if you want to get real deep, all right, real deep, <laughs> skip the first two seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, pick up towards the end of season two. And then from there on out, it's wars, it's darkness. 
it's much more shades of gray, all this hope, optimism stuff that Star Trek's supposed to be about. It's there, but it's a much darker path to get there. There's sort of palace intrigue going on, and it's just fantastic. Once the Dominion War hits, awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah, I have I have a feeling that I will I will find it to be um probably quite full of classical illusions. I mean, so so one of the very few things that I know, right, is is his name is uh James Tiberius Kirk. Is that right? Correct. I mean, that's that's gotta be our that's gotta be our Tiberius, I think. Well, except Kirk was he was, you know, he he didn't go through that kind of evil ish period that Tiberius had oh. with whatever happened. <laughs> but but oh there is a I, I can't give that to you because that is a spoiler but there is a connection to Tiberius and a Kirk also don't get really hung up on the prime directive because Kirk does not follow that this whole non-interfering and like you know worlds that are pre-warp and pre-certain scientific development you don't really pay attention to that you got a job to do. It's kind of very, very complicated if you slow down. But, but further connections between Star Trek and Roman history. We we were messaging about this about I Claudius Picard. Man, Picard plays Patrick Stewart plays Sejanus, and he's got hair. And you informed me it was a wig, but it was very unsettling as a guy who grew up seeing him as Picard, and then in X Men. And a very old, sick, dying Professor X in Logan, which is an awesome movie. All of a sudden, he's got hair. I didn't know what to make of that. But he was fantastic. He's fantastic. And that's one of the great villains of, of TV history, novel history, and history history. I mean, Sejanus is, you know, Sejanus is fabulous. He's, he's so scary. What was his deal? What was the to what was the deal with Sejanus? What and we're, we're we're way off topic now, but I don't care. And we're going to ask some other questions. What was his what was going on with him? He was just trying to seize power, or or he just thought he could crush everybody. I mean, what made him tick to be so evil? Yeah, his dad so... not love him, or his mom <laughs> smack him too many times. I mean, what happened? Probably a combination. Yeah, it's it's hard because our source for Sejanus, our main sources. Um, Tacitus, who is a historian who's very hostile toward him. But yeah, he was um, of the equestrian order, which is the kind of like wealthy upper middle class of non-political people. Um, so they usually made their money in like trade or other unsavory occupations and they couldn't be in the Senate. So he is in this sort of like wealthy, um, but apolitical background but he's very ambitious and it does seem that he intended to to assassinate Tiberius and seize the the throne as it were for himself um conspires with um members of the imperial family to try to do it um and did a really good job of isolating Tiberius over the course of of several years um at, at one point Tiberius is living in Capri and Sejanus is his only line of communication to Rome. So it was very, you know, sort of abusive where he's isolating him to um, kind of take control and insinuate himself. But yeah, I do think if Tiberius hadn't turned on him and had him executed, that he would have attempted to assassinate him. Um, and then it just the whole thing could have turned out differently. So another great Star Trek villain is Gold Dukat from Deep Space Nine. His character arc always coming back to evil. Just very, very sejanus there. And one of the questions that Victor had wanted me to ask you about was how much I, Claudius, which I watched for the first time not long ago and was fantastic. It took like an episode and a half, but then I got really into it and it got going. But how much the how much I Claudius ruined the reputation of Livia or is there some truth by that? And if you could just tell us all who Livia was. Yeah. So Livia is the third and final wife of Augustus. Um, they got married when he was still Octavian. 
Um, she was married at the time when they met and um, her husband agreed to divorce her so she could marry this very powerful person. Um, she had a son, Tiberius, who ends up becoming the second emperor. Um, yeah, and so we know she was from the nobility. She was from a very powerful family. Um, <laughs> and yeah, our main ancient source for Livia is, again, Tacitus, who describes her as a scheming, poisoner, ambitious, um witch who only cares about getting her son Tiberius on the throne making sure that he is the heir when Augustus dies um because that's the only near contemporary source we have for her it's really hard to know if she was really like that um because Tacitus like, I don't like to, like, get all gendery about stuff because I don't work in that area. Um, I don't do scholarship on that. Uh, but Tacitus hated women. <laughs> um, so if you're a woman in Tacitus, you're either a stupid virgin, a promiscuous harlot, or a poisonous witch. Like, those are your three choices. It's a choose-your-own-adventure if you're a woman in Tacitus. Um, and so Livia, they're like character types. And so the character type he gives us for Livia is very much what we see in I, Claudius, um, because Robert Graves, the author of I, Claudius, um, the novel that came out in the 1920s that the show is based on, um, he was a trained classicist. And so the novel I, Claudius is like, like to call it Tacitus fanfic is like almost giving it too much creative credit. It's like basically Tacitus. Um, so all by way of saying Livia never had a good reputation, um, I, Claudius, doesn't make her seem any worse than the ancient sources do. I just couldn't tell you how accurate the ancient sources are because we have nothing to compare, really nothing to compare Tacitus to. Um, I mean, I would like to think she was more complex than that, um, but... It's really hard um, with these these women of the imperial family. We get such narrow, biased sources on them. Well, if you don't want to get into the gender studies aspects of it, I will. Because what we clearly need is another white guy talking about <laughs> these issues, right? We'll bring. Uh, we've never. We haven't heard from people who look like me enough. That's that's what. No, in all seriousness. So your your take on it is her reputation was always negative, and but the TV portrayal, at least for a modern, wider audience, created that understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just uh, you know, it's really kind of similar with someone like Caligula, who you know didn't look great in the historical record, but the modern depictions have really like cemented that. Interesting. Okay, so we've got that. Now let's talk about. Augustus's legacy. And then I want to get into the Aeneid because I, I had a take on that that I wanted to go over with you. Uh, and I'm trying to, if I had to write on a whiteboard, what boil it down to one word or a sentence or a concept, what would Augustus's legacy be? What would the marketing campaign ad be to tell you about whatever his legacy is, good or bad? What what would you go with? Yeah, I mean, I think what he would like us to remember is peace and stability. Um, and there's some truth to that. Like, Rome does not have a civil war for another... I mean, the next civil war is in 69, so, you know, it's almost 100 years later. Um Rome didn't lose any foreign territory under his rule. The economy was stabilized. The birth rate increased largely because of his, his morality legislation. Um, so, so what I think his uh, slogan would be, would be like, yeah, like peace and prosperity, peace and stability. Um, uh, for me as a historian, kind of watching how it unfolds, not just immediately after his death, but kind of, you know, the slow slide into uh, ruin once again, um, uh, it, it, it 
his legacy for me is a question, which is uh, what is the price of stability? In the case of the Romans, they never had, uh, they lost their democratic republic. I mean, they had sham elections uh, for the next, you know, several, um, several decades, couple hundred years. But the Roman people were never politically free again. Um, now, if I'm, uh, you know, Rufus Minimus living on my, you know, crappy farm in Campania or wherever, do I care that elections are a sham? Well, probably not, because A, I probably didn't get to vote anyhow. You have to go to Rome in person to vote. And I can't leave my farm for whatever, three days. And what I know is that my son isn't getting conscripted to fight in a civil war. I don't have soldiers um, kicking me off my property um, to uh, to settle veterans there. And I have food because our grain supply is restored. So, you know, when I look at it as a historian, I say, you know, what what was the price of the stability? Well, they lost their what the Romans called libertas, their political freedom. But I, I don't know how much the ordinary Roman cared. Um, but it is an interesting, I guess by interesting, I mean horrifying um, thing to think about um, as, you know, our democracy is sort of undergoing some changes and we're coming up on, you know, a very consequential election and and to sort of think about what what would it mean to never have another presidential election well, that's basically what happened to the Romans. You know, they got to vote for consul, but the consuls didn't mean anything. Um, and so, so it's, I think, yeah, an interesting thing to, to think about at this moment in America's uh, democratic history. And, and Augustus really seemed to set, I don't know, maybe if laying a trap is the future is the right way to think about it, but he highlighted what would become a problem for Rome later on, which is succession, because it's much easier to just kill one guy than to dismantle an entire bureaucratic system that's designed to distribute power amongst, uh, you know, to be fair, Roman elites and what have you. And that gave rise to a lot more instability and made things a lot more complicated and highlighted a lot of problems and gave opportunities for a lot of really bad rulers to come into play, to come into power because there were no real checks on them. They just happened to be in the right family or they had a strong enough military. Yeah. It's astonishing that it worked as long as it did given all of those. And there were, you know, there were some uh, touch and go moments along the way, but you know, the fact that, you know, it, it basically continues to function in something resembling this principate for another couple hundred years, I think is is surprising given those inherent instabilities. Oh, it was, it, it's, it, it, and how long the empire continued to is just, it, anyway, uh, it, I mean, that it just, it, it's mind boggling. But w one other thing that uh, Victor wanted me to ask you about is, we, you talked about how Augustus ruthless coming to power. He's cutting people down left and right. And then he gets into power and he seems to take a step back, take a deep breath, put the sword down a little bit. Was that, I'm trying to think of other Roman leaders uh, who, who came to power as far as how common that was. It does seem a little bit unique historically, but maybe it's just because of how long he was in power. Yeah, there are um, two others who come to power in civil war and like make a big deal of the fact that like I, like Augustus, may have come to power in a terrible way, but I am ushering in a new golden age. Um, there's Vespasian, who wins the civil war of 69 um, and, uh, you know, crafts himself as kind of a new Augustus. And then another character that you've mentioned already, um, Septimius Severus, um, comes to power in another ugly civil war and again, tries to represent himself as a new Augustus. 
um, making a distinction between the way he came to power and the way he intends to rule. Um, I wouldn't say that either of their early careers could compare to the viciousness of what Octavian and the Triumvirs did. Um, I don't think there's any comparison for that. That was just from 44 to 31 BC was just a, a horror show that, yeah, really doesn't have many points of comparison. Right, because they just needed money, they needed land, and they just, you're in the way, you're getting out of the way one way or another. Yeah. Good times. It was different. It was a different era. You know, it was it was complicated. There were a lot of moving parts, things, you know, memos getting mistranslated. I mean, it's <laughs> was that line from Seinfeld? Is that frowned upon here? Is it? Uh, <laughs> but uh, l- let me let me turn to this, because w- one of the things that people do talk about when they talk about Augustus's legacy is he was a patron of the arts to some extent, which, of course, gives us the Aeneid, which I'm going to go ahead and pop. I'm going to pop an E on this episode uh, because I got a copy of it and read it. It's kind of a messy bitch in some respects. Mm -hmm. Thematically, I mean, it's great. I I love it. Don't get me wrong. But it's a little all over the place. And I know he never really finished it. Virgil never finished it. So maybe he was like midway through a couple of of edits and then he dies. But there's a lot. There's just a lot there to unpack. But I have a theory, and we can talk about the Aeneid a little bit more in a second. I have a theory. I want to run this by you. And I think I think I can say this because my wife looks about as Irish as possible. <laughs> and my daughter, while she does not have red hair or green eyes like my wife, has all the historical behavioral traits that are associated with redheaded women. Okay? So I think Dido either was a redhead or a strawberry blonde or her grandmother was a redhead, okay? And Dido, as we know, was the queen who founded Carthage. And I have a couple of reasons for that. And and here's why. When I had this theory, okay, right? Spoilers for people who don't know. She kills herself, okay? Because she's heartbroken that Aeneas leaves for the direction of the gods. And she doesn't just kill herself. She builds this huge funeral pyre, and she, she... puts a curse, a hex on generations of soon-to-be Romans, okay? And then she falls on a sword. And I ran this theory by my wife, and she said, yeah, it's really the the putting a hex on future Romans that I would agree with you, okay? When I read that, I was like, this is history's first redhead. (laughs) And I just that that just came through. It was a very redhead vibe to me. I don't know if you have a take on the way Dido handled rejection or what, but but please have at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great take. I think in this lighting, you probably cannot tell. I um, mean, of course, a podcast is an audio medium, but I am I am also part of the Ginger family, so that uh, that resonates. Yeah, the. Um, uh the ability to hold on to a grudge and to express it in such dramatic fashion does seem like a quality of my people um i will say that that virgil describes her hair as um flavus um flavus uh it means like tawny it's the the word that's used for lions and so that could actually go either way that could describe a strawberry blonde um probably not like a like a carrot top um but a a flavus could be um could be a a reddish blonde i think so that that adds some um linguistic support as well all right and here is this is from book four the tragic queen of carthage this is what really tied it home okay those of you who don't have redhead friends or family members you may not understand what a redhead crying face looks like okay but just watch any julianne moore movie and you will see it okay so here it is this i'm going to read this out this is where it really came together but dido trembling desperate now with the monstrous thing afoot her bloodshot eyes rolling quivering cheeks blotched and pale with imminent death that's it right there. That is a historical description of redhead crying face, right? Yeah, that's the redhead ugly cry. Exactly. So it, when I was at law school at WNL, I, I think I used that exact line. I was I, I did this thing called our we had an honor council 
And if you got into trouble, you would have to go before the honor council. And we were working with a, a student who was going through it. And she was really nervous because she was in law school and uh, she was concerned about how, how this might impact her ability to sit for the bar exam and everything. And she comes out of the hearing and we're waiting for the decision. And she's like about to burst out in tears. And she, she's, I'm good friends with her. She's a redhead. And I said, look, don't cry. I know how it looks when a redhead cries. <laughs> and she starts laughing and she calms down. But yeah, I mean, I, th this was, I'm trying to find the line that that they put. Yeah, here it is. This is the hex that she puts on them. This is about line 780. Uh, <laughs> that is my prayer, my final cry. I pour it out with my own lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, hairy with hatred, all his line, his race to come, make that offering to my ashes, send it down below. No love between our peoples ever. No packs of peace Come rising up from my bones, you avengers still unknown, to stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours, shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword, this is my curse, war between all our peoples, all their children, endless war. I mean, right? That... Yeah, I mean, we we talk about Taylor Swift as like the poet laureate of breakups, but but I think I think Dido could could do a breakup burn better than than pretty much anyone. That that is a way to go out. That is an exit. Like from Rome, who was it that uh, killed herself out in front of uh, the Augustan family? Uh, HBO's Rome. I can't remember who it was. She oh, kills wow. herself after like being out there for three days and. Mark Anthony says, now that is an exit. Yeah. I mean, oh, man. Now I can't remember. I love that show. It's um, fantastic. Seen. It's like somebody's mother, maybe? Yes. It was Brutus's mom. Brutus's mother. Yeah. Servilia. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way to go. You want to go out and be remembered, right? Right. Right. I mean, they they the Greeks called it kleos um, to be spoken of. And yeah, the worst thing that could happen to you after death was to be forgotten. Well, she got remembered with that one. Uh, that that was man. That's a great show. It was too bad that it got cut short. But I think right. it was so expensive. <laughs> It couldn't have been cheap. I mean, the production value was ridiculously high. It wasn't like I Claudius, where it's just a bunch of cardboard. <laughs> the cardboard boxes. Right. Yeah, no, they they um they everything was like full scale on a soundstage um at some famous Italian soundstage outside of Rome. But I, I've never been there, but I've had friends who have visited and you like walk through this full scale reproduction of the city of Rome. Um so yeah, I think it was costing HBO BBC like millions of dollars um yeah but yeah it's like it's flawless it's so good it's fantastic uh give us a good book to read about augustus or from the augustan era oh um great question so my favorite book um it's more about his career as octavian but it leads up to him becoming augustus it's called The Roman Revolution, um, and it's by Sir Ronald Syme. Um, it, it's an academic book, but it's written in a very, I think, readable, engaging tone. He's one of the most um, just sort of like lively, conversational types of writers. Um, but what I think is so interesting about it is that he wrote this story of how Rome got an autocrat while he was living in Rome in the 1930s. Um, so there's a real sense of like urgency to it that um, again, I think is is maybe um, worth thinking about here in 2024 um, to kind of read Augustus through the eyes of someone who is seeing the rise of like literal OG fascism around him. Um, but it, it's also, his voice is just so charming. He was from New Zealand um, and just has this sort of like very cheerful way of talking about just uh, terrible things. Um, yeah, so the Roman revolution. All right. And I, I meant to thank you too, because you mentioned to me the podcast, I Potius. 
<laughs> about uh, about uh, Claudius, which I have to I have to thank you one because I find it very enjoyable, but two, I was never a huge fan of John Hodgman. Nor was I until that. Okay, yeah, and I can't remember who it is that is. Uh, Elliot Kalen is is doing the show with them. They were both on the Daily Show. My thing with Hodgman was he came on when a lot of the OG guys who made the Daily Show, the Daily Show, into the thing that it was. He came on as they were starting to leave, and he just didn't seem to have that same thing that those other guys had. But he is fantastic in this, and it gets better with each episode. So I would highly recommend that to everybody. He also did a couple of things with the band. They might be giants. Don't judge me, but me and some friends do weird. They might be giants mashup music. We, we take old time tunes. And then uh, this lady named Rachel sings the, 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 they might be giants lyrics to it. Don't judge me. And so we do that and it's fun. Uh, and, but he was involved with some of their stuff. So I, it, this seems to be like like you know Billy Crystal. I always find terribly annoying, but you put him in as the voice of Mike Wazowski in Monsters Inc. Fantastic! This is just what John Hodgman was made for, apparently. Yeah, Where yeah. Did- I never really got his his sense of humor, um, but yeah, I, I love the podcast, and I I get that version of the theme song stuck in my head sometimes. That be do 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 be do 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 do. Um, so there's a a bonus earworm for anyone who checks it out. One of the most interesting memories I will ever have about watching I Claudius was our dog, Rosie, loves watching TV with us. And if there's a horse, she like freaks out, does not like horses, does not like seeing other dogs or cats on TV. But our cat, no interest in it. But, you know, at the beginning, when they have the snake come across the screen, she saw it once and was like trying to attack the TV. She was (laughs) very intently looking, looking into it. And I think I looked it up. Cats apparently keep snakes away. Mm. I, I, I was very surprised by that uh, to, to learn that, but apparently uh, cats will will keep snakes away. And so I was very interested that that was the one thing, as old as our cat Murphy is, that has ever interested her about the TV. It was I Claudius because the snake. Wow, and you don't think she was just excited to see I Claudius? You think it was specifically the snake? Yes, because as soon as the snake was gone, she left. You're not a big Derek Jacoby fan or something. No, she was she was gone and she was back to doing what she does, which is run the whole household and be difficult for the rest of us. There's some stories there. I, I will not get into it, but there's a lot. Okay, so uh hitting the home stretch on the podcast. On this one, I like to give guests a future podcast topic that they would like to hear covered. So fire away. What could we cover on the classical antiquity side quest? Oh, gosh. So someone I have been thinking about a lot um, as part of a class I taught last semester is Marcus Aurelius. Um, He's sometimes called the philosopher king because not only was he emperor, he was a stoic philosopher. And we have a bunch of his um, his writings. Um, People probably will remember him from the movie Gladiator. He's the um, good guy. I think he dies in the beginning of the movie. His son is Commodus, the one who like kind of ruins everything. Um, but but to talk about the two of them, I think could be really fun, especially because my understanding is there is a sequel to Gladiator coming out soon. So if people want to rush up on their their uh commodus history before that um that would be a lot of fun all right i'm gonna stall here for a minute because you mentioned uh you mentioned gladiator that was based on a movie called the fall of the roman empire that's where the story came from in which marcus aurelius was played it's on youtube shout out to victor for sending that to me Marcus Aurelius was played by someone with deep Star Wars connections, okay? Super deep Star Wars connections. None other than Alec Guinness. Oh, okay. Exactly. He played Marcus Aurelius. Oh, that's perfect. Like, I can see that. He he was great. It's a long movie. Sophia Loren is in it. Uh, She plays Lucilla. 
and Christopher Plummer plays Commodus. It's a very, very good movie. I would highly recommend it to everybody. But that's where the story comes from for Gladiator. And as I was sitting in the theater yesterday to go see Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which I enjoyed. Um, Ooh, more classical illusions. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a huge... Although I will say this. And I get that they named the, the ape character Noah for Noah's Ark reference, and I understand that. I, I get it. I get it. I just... Noah does not scream leader to me. That name <laughs> does not scream leader. But I, but but as I was waiting through almost 30 minutes of previews to get to the movie, I saw a trailer for the new Alien movie, and I'm all done. I d just, let's just do something new. Do we need to go back and do another sequel? At this point, although it is called Alien Romulus, so... Okay, I mean that is a little exciting, but a little excited. <laughs> but still, I'm just like let's do something. Let's do something a little more exciting, people. Let's let's do something a little more exciting. But it is it is called Alien Romulus and it's going to come out at some point here soon. So, I did enjoy Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes though. Very good. And I'm going to go one more nerd reference here before we close this out. This is this is a good one, okay? Marcus Aurelius we mentioned J.J. Abrams earlier, one of J.J. Abrams' most, one of his best, if he'd done nothing else but just this, that's all he would have needed to do. It's a TV show called Fringe. It lasts for five seasons. I think it's on Prime. It is like the X-Files, but 10,000 times better. Okay? There is a Marcus Aurelius quote in one of those episodes. I can't explain, if you give any part of fringe away you just give too much away but i would highly recommend that now if you don't want to invest in the entire five season story arc you can you can dumb it down to one episode which will then make you watch it the entire thing it's in season two okay the title of the episode is and i'll get the number of it here let me load it up okay season two episode 18 White Tulip. Okay. Mm -hmm. Peter Weller. Yes, that Peter Weller from Robocop plays a physicist. Okay. And it is unbelievable. The cast for Fringe, just amazing. Okay. Uh, John Noble, who was in The Lord of the Rings. I can't remember exactly who he played in Lord of the Rings, but he's in it. His acting is just, I, it's fantastic. I mean, it's some of the best acting you will ever see. It's a great show. I highly recommend it to everybody. That is my last deep cut nerd reference of the day. I'm like, <laughs> is that is that enough for you? It's. I mean, it's good that I'm on summer vacation, so I have time to follow up on all these recommendations. I'll tell you, if you watch White Tulip, and don't watch any more episodes of Fringe, I will be stunned. <laughs> it is it is so good. I mean, uh, I can't remember who plays Olivia in it off the top of my head. Uh, give me one second here. Anna Torv plays, Livia, uh, plays uh, Olivia, and she's been in a lot of stuff. She was in The Last of Us most recently, but she's, she's very, very good. It's a very good show. So... With all that out of the way, we've covered Augustus. We've talked about the Aeneid. We dropped some Star Trek, Star Wars, Moot Alien, Planet of the Apes, Taylor Swift references. We've concluded that Dido had very strong redhead vibes. We've, we've, we've learned a lot today on this side quest. So if you want to stay in touch with us, you can go to our website, bullcitycoordinators.com. We're on Twitter at AntiquityPod. Uh, I've post a lot on instagram at duke fb coverage long story there rome wasn't planned out in a day nor was this and you can find us easily anywhere and just remember folks you can email us to have questions answered or you can call us 540-632-0160 and you can get on the podcast and as we stated earlier the classical antiquity podcast is a podcast without end <laughs>